Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With me is Daniel McAdams, our co-host. Daniel, good to see you. How are you this morning, Dr. Paul? Doing well, doing well. And uh, let's talk about coronavirus. A have we, bit. Have yeah. we talked about it before? A couple of times. But people want to know about it, and we want to know about it, and wish we knew more about it. it we've been struggling with uh, whose statistics we should believe. I know, I know the ones I don't want to believe, but getting to the bottom of it, and there's so much discrepancy in it, we want to talk a little bit about that and how to figure out where it is because policy depends on it. In the old days, you could have an epidemic and nobody paid any attention and they just did. It wasn't a big government political stunt. It wasn't yeah. an attack on civil liberties. It wasn't involved when the stock market uh, had the biggest crash ever. So the conditions are different, but the big thing is, is believing our government. But I think, uh, you know, it was mentioned in the 50s, there was a major pandemic and nobody really cared. But, you know, I think in one sense, it, we're healthier because people are more skeptical of government and they yeah. don't want to believe them, but they still get away with a lot of lies. There was one article uh, I read, uh, matter of fact, it was an ABC report and it had to do with uh, the, uh, the discrepancies uh, in, in, in reporting uh, by the Chinese in Iran. Oh, they were hiding things. They were cheating and misreporting. Uh -huh. And I say, probably so. You know, that, that does happen. And, uh, but I, I don't think I'm going to send the military in there. Matter of fact, I'd like to get our military uh, out of the South China Sea trying to look for an accident to happen. Yeah. But, but never, nevertheless, uh, uh, they're, they're saying the whole issue is they've lied to us and they've caused the whole problem and they caused our stock market to fall. But, but the whole thing is, is we're very much aware and witness it personally and heard them testify that our officials lied to us. And the history is showing, you know, they've been lying for a long time. Misinformation even for World War II and the Spanish-American War and the World War I, but especially Vietnam and uh, especially, you know, the uh, Persian Gulf Wars and remaking the Middle East. I mean, our government, they're, they're big lies, too. A lot of people died. Millions of people died. And we're still suffering from that. And we're still following the same foreign policy. So this whole idea that you can narrow it down and and say these bad guys in China and around have everything to, uh, you know, to take, be responsible for. I think it's a bit gross distortion of what's really happening. I think that is sort of what's going on with the statistics. They vary from day to day and from group to group. And, and uh, for some reason, I work on the assumption that the numbers have been exaggerated in the direction of trying uh, to uh, uh, make the people more hysterical because it's to the benefit of the authoritarians to scare the living daylights out of the people and they'll roll over and they'll say, oh, okay, you guys sell us, you better stay in your house forever. Well, most people did, most people followed the rules. But guess what? They're getting tired of staying in their house and they're starting to sense that maybe a little bit of freedom is what we need now. And that I, direction, I think, is what we need to encourage. Yeah, but it will, the tyrants will not let up that easy. And what we're talking about here, I mean, these are policies that affect tens of millions of people, literally the lives of millions of people. Yet they're being based on such unreliable, misreported, and politically manipulated data. It's, I don't know that any time in history there's been such an event. We have a couple of things, and there's this huge discrepancy now between the CDC's daily uh, tally of death toll and its weekly tally. Um, and we can have the first clip. This is the daily tally. The CDC tells us that 65,735 people have died. This is based on one of their tallies. If we can actually skip ahead two, uh, to one more. And now, now here's something that came out on May 1st telling us that from uh, February 1st to April 28th, 37,000. That's a 37,000 person discrepancy. Uh, there are plenty of ways they're trying to explain it away, but it's there and it's very confusing. If we could back up one, here's another important point, Dr. Paul. And these are the daily COVID deaths. Uh, that, that second uh, column is interesting because it shows uh, second from the bottom on 4-18-2020, there were 10,408 deaths. That's down from 12,000 the week before. You go ahead to the 25th of April, you see a huge reduction, 3,271 reduction. So it looks clear 
from these numbers, of course, nothing is ever certain, that it's decreasing significantly. So what happens, what does the media do in the face of this obvious, uh, at least to us, reduction? Let's do the next clip. This just came out in the New York Times today. They have to ramp up the terror. There's, if we have that next clip, yeah. Here's a new thing from New York Times, Dr. Paul. Trump administration projection and a public model. These are the same people, the CDC, right, that got it so wrong. Now they're saying, oh my gosh, the daily death toll will reach about 3,000 on June 1st. <laughs> you know, and this is the numbers that the same people that have bad numbers. And one final one, Dr. Paul, because this is what they do. The same article after they put out this, oh my gosh, it's going to go back up, which has never happened in the history of epidemics. Um, <clears throat> the next one, please. And this is from the same article. And this is the main point, Dr. Paul. The projections confirm the primary fear of public health experts. A reopening of the economy will put the nation back where it was in mid-March. Yeah, isn't it interesting? You pointed out where history, recent history shows, they reported this here and here a couple days later. So the reports don't even, their reports don't even match up in real time. But then they come along and you mention projections. All of a sudden they have to make it this, this tremendous increase in, in, uh, in, in the virus, in, uh, you know, infections as well as the deaths. But uh, then they, they don't even stop there. You know, they have to preach the gospel of, uh, of saying it's never going to be the same. We're going to have to change our way we live because there could be a new virus someday. Yeah, like there are about a 50 or 100 every year, yeah. you know, new <laughs> viruses, and that's where we get our immunity, you know. And uh, But they said there are going to be some new new viruses. But uh, they, they, they argue the case that it's never going to be the same and you better adjust. And uh, they're doing it, but the troops are getting restless. And, uh, and we have to give them as much information as we can and encouragement because it's going to be real hard to have absolutely proof of everything we need because it'll, it'll probably take some time. But I just hope somebody's keep, keeping close records because history is, is also I important. But this, this outrage over New York, and they did it with, with a straight face. They say, well, uh, we have just had a big bump in number of cases, 3,700. Uh, but uh, they died, and, and they died of coronavirus. But we didn't bother testing them, so we're asking them to change the death certificates and show that they died from coronavirus. And and nobody seems to care about that. They just get, let it go by. But the people who perpetuate, they do it with a straight face, as if, well, this is science, you know. Yeah. Uh, so the reports. Uh, are, are just so fictitious, and we're beginning to hear the stories about, uh, you know, young people don't get the disease, people who are most vulnerable are the ones who are elderly and very sick already, and they have so many different uh, diseases, and yet the virus is what to kill them. The virus is important, probably has a contributing factor, but for some people to get calls and realize that, that they're admitting, I say, well, you know, the death certificate isn't going to show that he had a stroke. The death certificate is going to show that he died of coronavirus. And they, they tell families that up front, yeah. which is just atrocious the way they do that. So it's believing this and sorting it out. This is why... Uh, you know, the way the epidemic was handled in the 50s was much better. You know, it, it passed. They probably got the best medical care. It was available to them. And it might have been better than what, when uh, Fauci passes out the medical care. Yeah, when, yeah. when medical care is collective, it always, always gets worse. But uh, so th this, this, is, uh, this is something that's been around and, uh, and it's still very bad is trying to figure out what is right. But I know one thing, and I've said it especially yesterday, that we, we shouldn't have a bunch of politicians making medical decisions like this and demagogues. And the money, you know, and then mix it in with a financial crisis, you know, uh, what else could we expect for what we had? This is not strange and unusual uh, when you think of the philosophy behind medical care uh, and the fanaticism of supporting corporate medicine and at the same time uh, diminishing any thought or process, medical schools don't don't don't, uh, don't bother even even in a try in a neutral way of holistic medicine. Yeah. They, they don't deal with that. It's everything, the diagnosis and the drug to use, and, and that that is that is it essentially. But 
people are starting to, to wake up to this because there's a lot of, of more natural medicine, but it doesn't come from the medical profession. It, it comes from independent people who go out. Fortunately, it's been spread on the Internet. Uh, so that's why I think we should be hopeful that uh, the message, uh, really, it's the message of liberty. You know, when, when you have free people making decisions, uh, they can handle it much better than when we have maybe two people in the administra yeah. administration making all the decisions, and when they mess up, this is what we get. And a few people, two or three people telling you exactly what the interest rate should be. Oh, yeah, interest rates should be zero or minus. Oh, that's good for the economy. Yeah. And, and we've gone along with this too much. Well, I've been saying for a while now, we're nearing the end, and the end can be beneficial. We'll have to give up on this dependency on government, whether it's in medicine or monetary policy or whatever. And uh, for that reason, we have to get as much information uh, accurately out to the people as we can. And, you know, the, the cooking of the books is something we've talked about. You say, why? Why would they do this? Why are they massively inflating numbers? Uh, and it's open. This is not a conspiracy theory. They admit it. If it's probable COVID, put it as COVID. Well, there are financial rewards to these hospitals who've messed everything up and they're going broke. There are financial rewards. USA Today did a fact check and found that, yes, it is true. There are financial rewards from listing COVID as the cause of death. There's additional financial rewards for putting people on ventilators. That's what have basically a 100% mortality rate, it looks like, or close to it. Some say you have $34,000 for each one they put on a ventilator. But something else happened in New York City that's important, and it's a, it's, a, it's a little reported scandal. The New York Post has reported on it a couple times, but uh, Governor Cuomo had a policy in New York which allowed infected seniors to return to their senior care facilities. And that is, what it, that is why it ravaged the senior, care, senior residential care homes in New York and why the death rate went sky high. They let these people back in who they knew were infected. I think the New York Post article even said they returned them with a, so with a collection of body bags, you know, for the eventuality. And this is all out there in the New York Post, several New York Post articles. So there was some human help in getting the older folks to, to die in New York. Yeah. But I wish we could uh, get excited about our own governor and say uh, our governor uh, has, uh, has control of this. Maybe he visited Sweden or something. <laughs> but it doesn't look good. Bad things are happening. And uh, I, think, uh, I think the governor probably really wants to do good, but there's also other pressures that he's under. But uh, the, uh, the thing that is, you know, we talked about Oyster Creek, yeah. uh, how unfairly a small little company because, you know, uh, having a nice house isn't so fancy. But but the point the owner there made was a lot of stores are open, a lot of people are coming in, a lot of people are disobeying the rules, and, and they need to because they're so insane. But this weekend the, in the news was uh, Odessa. Yeah. And uh, Odessa, uh, they had a bar owner. He was facing the same thing, economic calamity, and uh, he was going to open up the bar, and he was told, don't do it, and some people came in support, and that didn't go well because the uh, police uh, uh, came with the idea that we have to make them obey the law. So they ended up uh, roughing up a few people and arresting about eight people. And they said, well, we found out that they were illegally carrying their guns, you know, technicalities, because it's an open uh, open gun laws here. Yeah. You're supposed to be allowed to anyway. But uh, the, the, the whole thing is it was opening up a small bar. At the same time, even in our community now, we're starting to see more people with a little bit of relaxation. It's such a shame that we have to be excited when they give us back this much of our freedom, yeah. which we were supposed to be born with, that we could walk out of our house and walk down the street and walk in the park and go to the beach. So they give us this way. Ah, oh, they're wonderful people. Yeah. You know, they, they're doing this. But anyway, I, I don't think we've heard the last of uh, what's going on up in Odessa. Yeah, it's interesting because they brought in the SWAT team. They brought in the tank. They acted like they were invading Iraq, you know, to close this poor ice house out in West Texas. But you were listening to the sheriff of that county who was on, uh, I think, the radio this morning, and he was feeling some heat. He sounded like he was a little less confident. Yeah, he came across as uh, wanting to portray what a West Texas sheriff is, is like, tough and for the people. 
And uh, because there was a gun issue involved, he says, well, we had to arrest them for special reasons. They were disobeying the law. But I am never, if the governor comes and tells me that I have to take your guns away from you, I will not do it. You know, he was identifying with his, uh, his constituents there. So uh, he, he did this, and uh, then, then he said, but, this is the but, the big <laughs> one, but we had to deal with enforcing the law about congregating, freely walking into a store and congregating and meeting. It was, and breaking the governor's dictate, his executive order, he just pulled out of the sky, yeah, yeah. executive order, and it's the law of the land. And so the sheriff brags about, yeah, I, I was on the margin there, but I really will protect your gun rights. At the same time, he practically says, don't mess around because we don't want you to have your First Amendment right. <laughs> Why can't they protect our First Amendment rights, you know, the same way we're supposed to protect our Second Amendment right? But, uh, you, you know, it, it's a terrible situation. And uh, but, but it's all, uh, the sheriff's a case in study because uh, you can tell the politics that are going on and you can tell that he might have a libertarian instinct here, but uh, I would say that you won't find out, find much support for him being consistently pro-liberty in all issues. <laughs> and let's hope he's feeling some pushback because he should feel, he should feel awkward. But you know, from Texas to California and beyond, the authorities now that there is so much pressure to open up, they're, they're having to bow to some of this pressure. But what they're doing is they're doing their best to make reopening any corner of the economy so onerous, so difficult, so unpleasant that people won't even want to do it anyway. You know, they're setting conditions that the customers themselves will reject. Oh, you can only go by appointment only to a restaurant or to get your hair done. You have strict social distancing requirements, strict sanitation. You get to spray it down with bleach between each customer. Uh, 25% capacity, and you know the restaurant business is tough. And so the government's telling you you can only have 25% of your normal customers. No one's going to break even, A. And B, no one's going to go to a restaurant with such horrible conditions. You can't even enjoy yourself. They'll probably put plexiglass in front of you. And you've got to ask why. Uh, you know, what, what is the reason they want to keep the power? Are they risk averse? You know, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a big question, but they're making it as unpleasant as possible. Yeah, to me, it's hard hard to figure out because they do the opposite of what I would like to see done. And, uh, you know, a free society is going to have its problems. But I think people should uh, be more, uh, you know, in the mood to enjoy each other and enjoy their facilities. They can make more money and have their own house, you know, and their own property and all. And sometimes when you see people doing this, it, it's so unnecessary. Uh, and it's almost like when you see three people on the beach and... Uh, and, oh, they're, they're too close together and they're <laughs> going to get arrested. And it's almost like these authoritarians, and that, that's sort of contagious like a virus. They are endorse this sort of macho stuff. And, and they do this, and it's almost like they cannot stand to see anybody having any fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's what's going on now. But one of the things that hopefully uh, will catch on and, uh, and you know, uh, slow this thing down, and that is whether it's being, whether the closure is being done or the opening, it's always unfair. Governments are always unfair. Oh, we're going to have a draft, but it'll be a fair draft. We're going to have a tax, and it's going to be a fair tax. The rich get off, and the poor will pay the, the yeah. sums through inflation, this sort of thing. So it's always, always going to, uh, to be fair. But the closing down was not fair. I mean, uh, you know, the, the richer you were, the very, very rich made billions oh, of yeah. dollars yeah. on it because they, they said, well, you just got in front of the line, you know, and got the money, and then there wasn't anything left for the smaller companies. So it's uh, it's it's one of the, one of those things that uh, they they will continue to do this, and when as they close when they open up again, just like what we've already seen, uh, it's a little bit better at the shopping centers. You can go in; uh, it's still it's still a total insult. Yeah. You have to go through certain doors and check your, you know, all yeah. that stuff. Uh, but, but, uh, and you, you still, you still have to monitor, but, uh, the people who have to, who want to do this, they want to just get their life back again. And it's, a, it's, a, it's such a shame that, uh, it's so painful to do this, but it's, it's urgent to continue 
uh, you, you know, in this effort. Think highly of uh, your liberty and realize that, uh, that it's going to be necessary. You know, I always argue you should love liberty for uh, moral reasons mm -hmm. and for legal reasons, uh, but you... But ultimately, one of the strongest is for practical reasons. You know, if, if the authoritarians and socialism was a perfect system, everybody is rich and prosperous and had a lot of leisure and, and all the amenities of life you wanted, you know, we'd have a little tougher time arguing. Of course, I would despise it because I still want to make up my own mind. But that is, we don't even have to worry about that contest because they always make it worse. So when this thing totally collapses. We're in a collapse like this right now. When it's totally gone, the government is going to be seen as totally inept. So the more they are seen as failures in trying to coerce us all like cattle, yeah. uh, the better it will be. It'll give more encouragement to other people. And, uh, and, and eventually people say, let's all go to the beach. <laughs> you know? And, and if, if I thought for a minute that all of a sudden uh, that would automatically increase uh, the death rate, uh, I would say that uh, I'd, I'd, I'd think about it. But that isn't the case. When you just pointed out about how they handled the nursing homes, uh, that didn't decrease the death rate. It increased the death rate. And how many people are, have died, you know, because they couldn't get to a doctor? And how many people died because they don't have now money and they can't even buy any food? And I think there's going to... We're optimistic. I'm optimistic. But I think, uh, unfortunately, I think we're going to see more violence uh, because Wendy's today is running out of hamburger meat. <laughs> so, uh, and, and then we could sort of make fun out a little bit. But that's a pretty significant thing. In a country like ours, yeah. you don't, can't even get a hamburger. Yeah. We're running out of meat. Oh, it's, a, it's a shame. It's terrible. And, you know, again, people that are flipping out. If you want to stay home, no one is going to grab you by the collar, take you down to the beach, take you to a restaurant. You know, this is the thing where the rest of us who make a decision, you know, with a risk in mind, can, should be able to do what we want. No one's going to force other people, and there are people who should be careful. But, you know, I would just close, Dr. Paul, by saying, you know, the, in the spirit of ridicule being the best weapon, I think it's even stronger than guns as a weapon, I'm going to uh, borrow a, a term from our good friend Bob Wenzel from Target Liberty blog, who calls these, uh, these leaders, these tyrants, power freaks. And that's a great word. And if I can go, I have, just have two slides that shows what the f power freaks are up to uh, these days. You can go to that next slide. Here it is. Look at this, Dr. Paul. Riverside County, one person per pool policy <laughs> is now in effect. And this is for private pools. You know, not necessarily the one in your backyard, but you know, oh. you, it's not that bad yet. But, but if you live in a complex, so one person, so there's going to be a line of kids probably 20 miles long. Okay, you've had your five minutes in the pool, now get out. Yeah. It's insane. And here's the next one. Here's California. Look at this. Governor Newsom issues a list of approved activities. He now will allow Californians to watch sunsets. So thank you, Master. Thank you, Master. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, very good. You know, uh, power freak is a pretty good term, and that's what we should do. We should accuse them. They're freakish people who their whole life is depends on how much power they have. Sometimes it's just political, and sometimes it's emotional, and sometimes it's financial. But uh, power and wealth isn't necessarily always bad if you get it honestly. But when it becomes political power, it's power freaks that uh, are using it against others to undo the liberties of other people. But the word that I used isn't ne nearly as neat as uh, power freaks because the term I use, and I've used it even sometimes in friendly debates with my colleagues, uh, I would say that's an authoritarian approach to thing. And it, authoritarianism, they don't like, you know, they're, they're no, we're good people. Uh, we want good socialism and we want to make everybody better. Uh, they're not authoritarians as long as they're doing it because they know how to handle it. But you don't even have to be ugly with people when you call them authoritarians. If you let them know, that's an authoritarian approach. Our, our approach is a little bit different than that. We believe in voluntarism. We think it's, uh, it's better. And can you think of what it would be like if we handled other nations that way too instead of the authoritarian approach of, of sanctions and bombs and threats? and intimidations, uh, it would be so much better for interpersonal relationships and community relationships as well as relationships between countries. I, I think the uh, voluntary approach, uh, which obviously will be imperfect because man is imperfect, but 
what we don't want, since we know man is imperfect and they get worse when they have power, they're power freaks that are outlandishly using their authority to do mean and nasty things. We'd like to change all that. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon.